we finally have some real guidance as to what the future of cruising is going to look like. These guidelines are brand new and they talk about not just what the cruise experience is going to be like on board, but it answers some of the questions that we've been asking for months. What's going to happen if somebody on board does get coronavirus? How are the cruise lines going to deal with testing? How are they going to deal with quarantine? That's all answered in this video. These guidelines are from the EU, so they're mostly focused on European cruising. But that said, I think most American cruise lines will probably be adopting these things too. Before we get into the video, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I bring you a new video every single week and the cruise industry is changing ridiculously fast at the moment. I wouldn't want you to miss any updates, so make sure you hit that subscribe button. It's suggested that a good approach to cruising is for cruise lines to start by doing shorter duration cruises and limiting the ports. So we may see a lot of three, five, seven night cruises, and it may be that you only visit two or three ports during your cruise. I think this makes perfect sense. And honestly, I would go on a cruise right now, even if it didn't go anywhere. One thing that this document does clear up is around doctor's notes. There was a lot of speculation for a while that everybody over a certain age would have to have a doctor's note in order to sail. This is saying that that is not the case. If you're somebody who's over 65 and you have chronic medical conditions or you're immunocompromised, something like that, it's a good idea and it's recommended to speak to a doctor before you travel. But this isn't saying that everybody over a certain age has to have a doctor's note. That said, there could be specific cruise lines who do decide that this is a thing, but it just means that overall, this is not being enforced on the cruise lines. We're gonna go through this video in chronological order so that we can go on an imaginary cruise. So the first thing we need to do is embark the ship. When you get to the embarkation desk, you're gonna to have to fill out one of those forms that says that you've not been unwell for the last however long. There will be some new questions on that form related to coronavirus. So it will say things like, have you cared for anyone with coronavirus? Do you know anyone with coronavirus? Any possibility of you having coronavirus and they're gonna to wanna to know about it. These forms aren't really very effective. If somebody wants to just put no, then they will put no. So they're not too effective, but I think they're there and they're a good first line of defense. The person who's doing that and checking you in isn't gonna be medically trained, but they are gonna be looking out for things. If you do look like you're physically unwell, they will refer you to the second stage of medical screening. The second stage of medical screening will be done by a medical professional. They may test you for coronavirus. They'll probably do a temperature scan. And at that point, they'll decide what to do. If you do have coronavirus or they do suspect that you have coronavirus, they will deny you boarding. If they did deny you boarding onto the cruise, they'd also deny everybody else in your party boarding. The list of things that are possible coronavirus symptoms are very, very long and they do include things like headaches. So in theory, if someone in your party had a headache, you should all be denied boarding. I don't think it's gonna be that extreme at all, but if you did take the guidelines to the letter, that's kind of what it says. The cruise lines have got a lot of things that they have to do before they can get passengers on board and cruise. One thing that they may consider doing is giving everybody a coronavirus test as they board the ship. That said, that's not really very fast or efficient. And at the moment, it's not really very practical. Going forward, the test may be better. They may give you an instant result and then they may be implemented more. But at the moment, I think it's unlikely, even though cruise lines could do this. Testing passengers for antibodies is something that is not included in this at all. There's still some debate around the effectiveness of the antibody tests. We don't know how long the antibodies last for. If you're actually protected, if you've got the antibodies, nobody really knows. So antibody testing will not be a part of any sort of medical screening to get on a cruise. There will be, at least in the short term, a lot of temperature checks going on on board. Temperature checks aren't really that effective. You can hide a temperature with medicine and some people just have a high temperature. Maybe they're having a hot flush or something like that. But temperature checks will be a part of cruising going forward. If you're a crew member and your temperature goes above 38 degrees, you will have to remove yourself from work. You'll have to self-isolate. And these guidelines say that you should still be paid by the cruise line, even if you have to self-isolate due to coronavirus symptoms, which I think is fantastic. I suppose this is in place so that people feel that they can self-isolate if they are feeling unwell, rather than having to go to work to get paid. These guidelines suggest that once a day temperature screening for all passengers could be in place. And if there is a coronavirus case on board, that could be increased to say twice per day for every passenger. In addition to this, it is strongly recommended that the crew of the cruise ship do have coronavirus tests and that they have them 
frequently. It could be that all of the crew for every cruise line has to have a coronavirus test every two weeks, for example. Any passenger who is found to have a raised temperature will have to immediately isolate themselves, report themselves to the medical team on board and await further instructions. These guidelines do say that a cruise line should be able to safely quarantine 5% of the people on board the ship into single cabins. This does mean that the cruise line may have to reduce the capacity of the ship because there's just not enough space. So what may happen is that if you do have a high temperature, you'll be moved to a cabin nearer to the medical center so that it can keep an eye on you. You'll be there by yourself. Of course, if you're a child, you'll be there with a parent. And they're advising that this cabin has at least a window so that you can get some fresh air in there. I do think a lot of people have been very worried by the news stories that we saw at the start of this outbreak where families would be quarantined on cruise ships for two, three weeks at a time. Fortunately, I don't think we're going to see that again in the future. Cruise lines have learnt their lesson and as part of this, this says that cruise lines have to have a plan for quarantining people on land. Of course, if you're out in the Atlantic and you've got a long time before you can get to land, it's important that they can quarantine people on board. But the main plan at the moment is to get people to land and then quarantine them, not to quarantine the entire ship. One idea that this guidance sets out is to split the passengers into cohorts or groups and give people set times for things so that you reduce the number of other passengers that you bump into. This reminds me of when I was at school and our year group was split into two sides. I don't really in reality know how much this is going to work. It's quite hard to make people go where they're supposed to be at a set time, but maybe things like dining will become more fixed because of this. The idea too behind having different groups or cohorts is that it does make tracing easier. The cruise lines are required to be able to trace the people who's come in contact with each other. In case somebody does get coronavirus on board, they need to be able to tell everybody else. These guidelines say that when you're waiting to board your cruise or you're transporting or you're doing something where there's a lot of people, a distance of at least 1.5 meters should be maintained between different passengers or more if the home port of that ship has the say two or three metre rule, you'd have to do the, the bigger distance. This could be very, very difficult on things like embarkation day. And the guideline says that it is strongly recommended that if social distancing is not possible, all passengers wear a mask. I know some people are really, really upset about the idea of wearing a mask, but I think in reality, if you do want to go on a cruise, you are at some point going to have to wear a mask. We will talk more about masks later in this video, but there's loads of other things that the cruise line will try and do to avoid you being in a situation where you can't social distance. So when you're boarding, when you're walking down a corridor, when you're in the shops on board, there may be specific places where you're supposed to walk. There may be markers on the floor so that you know how far you have to stay away from other people. If you're waiting to board and say you're in a terminal which has fixed seats that cannot be moved, they may put signs or cones or something on the seats that you can't sit on in order to make sure that people do stay apart. These guidelines, of course, have a heavy focus on hygiene. It's very, very important that passengers and crew do wash their hands and sanitize their hands when they can't wash their hands. We're gonna see a massive increase on hand sanitizer on cruise ships. And this guidance actually suggests that it does go in the cabins so people can take it with them when they're out and about on the ship. This guidance too does say that gloves are no replacement for good hand hygiene and that they do provide a false sense of security. So the cruise line is gonna much prefer you to just frequently wash your hands as opposed to go on wearing gloves. There's actually a section in this guidance which is called respiratory etiquette, which is basically a very fancy way of saying if you sneeze or if you cough, you should do it in a tissue and you should dispose of it. When it comes to masks, this guideline strongly recommends that all crew and all passengers wear masks when they're in places where social distancing is not possible. It's important to remember that this guidance is for the cruise lines. It's not that the cruise lines are strongly recommending that you wear a mask. A cruise line could make it compulsory or they could get rid of it altogether. But this guidance is strongly recommending to the cruise lines that they make their passengers and their crew wear masks. You will be seeing crew members wearing masks on cruises going forward. It's recommended that they wear masks whenever they're dealing with the passengers. If it is to do with food preparation, if it is to do with cleaning your room, you're likely to see the crew wearing masks. And they're gonna be doing this all day, every day. So please be kind to everybody who works on a cruise ship. 
This guidance actually completely discourages the use of elevators. Of course, some people do need to use elevators, but if you're somebody that can walk, definitely walk. It's not only good to avoid the people in the elevator, but it's also a good way to avoid putting on weight on a cruise because some of those cruise ships are so big. If you are someone who takes an elevator, it is strongly recommended that in elevators you wear masks. And if all of your other passengers are wearing masks and you're not, I wouldn't want to be that person. A face mask should always be used if you are visiting the medical facility on board and it's okay to wear a cotton face mask which isn't a medical grade face mask. Even if you just have a face covering, that's okay for this purpose. Another thing that people have been worrying about for a while and that this guidance puts to bed is the worry about ventilation and air conditioning on board. This says that the ventilation must be constantly operating and it must use as much outside air as possible. If it is possible for the ventilation to be 100% fresh air, the cruise lines will do that. And if it's not, the cruise line should be looking into different types of filters to try and make the air quality as good as they can. We will see everything that is fixed down on a cruise ship cleaned and cleaned constantly. Any type of handle or button is gonna be disinfected multiple times a day, constantly. There's gonna be people whose jobs it is just to keep everything sanitized. Some things like magazines and things that can't really be cleaned will probably just disappear from cruise ships. There is a emphasis on moving towards things like using the big post screens, like having things on apps, having things on your TV, rather than having lots of paperwork and leaflets that can't really be cleaned. When you check out of the cruise, the cruise cabin is gonna to have to be deeply cleaned as it is already, but they're also gonna to have to ventilate the cabin. So they're gonna to have to maybe just leave the balcony door open for an hour. A bit more difficult if you have an inside cabin, but I suppose they'll just leave the door to the corridor open for a bit. I'm pretty sure that they already do this, but now it's gonna be a strongly recommended guideline. Everything that's in the cabin that can be cleaned will be cleaned. And the thing that is really not upsetting me but the thing that is going to make a big difference to my cruise is that they want to remove things like kettles and mini bars things that can't really be cleaned that well and most passengers do use i love having a kettle in my cabin to make a cup of tea in the morning so i'll definitely miss that if they do get rid of kettles but of course i understand there are bigger problems than my morning cup of tea the guidelines do suggest that these things may be available by request but I'm not sure that I would bother doing that. It also says that they might put covers on the TV remotes and the air conditioning remotes so that you're not actually pressing the buttons and they can be cleaned really easily, which I think I like. I know a lot of people who do take disinfectant wipes and sprays on cruises and the remote controls are always one area that's really well cleaned. Towels and t-shirts and textiles should be cleaned regularly, but this guidance says that it should be discouraged from being changed too frequently and the actual example here is that they should avoid washing your towels twice a day i really don't know who on a cruise is having their towels changed twice a day if anyone does that at home please let me know because that sounds like a lot of work when it comes to the cruise ship actually getting the food on board for you to eat everyone who's involved in that process will be wearing protective equipment, they'll be washing their hands and they may actually disinfect some packets as they do come in. It is recommended that all self-service food does not exist on a cruise ship anymore. This one is a little bit heartbreaking because I love a buffet, but it does say that if a cruise line doesn't want to get rid of the buffet, they can still have it as long as certain hygiene measures are in place. This is that the crew will probably bring you your food or at least serve your food to you. There's still going to be some sort of buffet on a cruise ship. There's going to be somewhere to grab quick food because so many people love that. And it's quite easy for the cruise line compared to the whole sit down lunch, sit down dinner thing. So they're not going to completely get rid of buffets, but it definitely isn't going to be anything like we've seen before. You're not going to be able just to wander up and get a cookie if you want one. You're either going to have to go and ask or you have to get a crew member to get it for you. It is preferred that food when it comes to you is wrapped. So you may have kind of a quick grab and go sandwich, something like that, which is wrapped in a packet. That's the ideal situation. Things like ketchup and salt and pepper may change to the little disposable packets rather than the reusable bottles. It is a shame to go back to kind of disposable little packets of ketchup and salt and things like that because most of them are plastic packaging 
and we were kind of going away from the plastic and it does feel like this is a step back but I guess if it has to be done then it has to be done. One of my favourite bits of guidance from this is that you should only eat on a table with people from your party or from your cabin. I'm not a big fan of table sharing so to me this is a really quite a nice thing to know that I'll always be able to get a table for two when I want one but a lot of people do really love table sharing when they cruise it's quite a traditional cruising element so for those people it is a massive shame that you're probably not going to be able to meet and mingle with new people on a cruise this does raise a question for me about solo travelers because a solo traveler is expected to eat by themselves for an entire cruise that doesn't sound like fun the actual experience of going to a main dining room may be quite different. They're going to try and keep distance between the passengers, which if you've been on some cruise ships, sometimes the tables are so close together. In order to make sure that everybody can eat and that they can be spread out, the guidelines do suggest that dining hours are extended. But who realistically is going to want to eat at 11 or 12 at night? To be fair, I would probably be the person who would happily eat earlier. I could eat dinner at four and that wouldn't even bother me. Be quite happy with that. You can always get more food later. So maybe that's a possibility. If the dining times are extended and you're in these groups or cohorts that we were talking about earlier, that may mean that your crew stick with you for that time and that they don't work the entire dining service. So it may make it a bit better for the crew, maybe. I think I'm trying to find anything positive here. Guests should hand sanitise when they get to the restaurant and this should be enforced. This is another part that I really like about this guidance is that the crew members on board will be monitoring and making sure that people sanitise their hands before they come in for their evening meal. I am a massive fan of booking on an app, booking online, not booking things in person and that's going to be strongly encouraged going forward. It's all about trying to limit the face-to-face -face interaction and not speaking with people if you don't need to. I'm fine with that. Of course this isn't really practical in every situation. Sometimes you do need to speak to someone face to face. Maybe you need to go to reception to get something sorted out. And what are they going to do in that situation is they're going to have plastic screens, they're going to have gloves, they're going to have hand sanitizer. They're going to do everything they can that even though that you are face to face with someone, you're as far from them as possible. The guidance says that reception staff should be able to spot the signs of coronavirus and that they should deal with that. If you do ever think that you have coronavirus or even if you just have a tiny little coronavirus symptom, definitely phone the medical center first. Don't go to reception in person. The reception is another area where they're gonna have things like markings on the floor to show people where they should stand. If you've ever been in a line on a cruise, you'll know that sometimes people don't stick to those rules. So hopefully they will be actually enforced by crew members who will say, get back. An interesting idea that I quite like is the possibility of an outdoor check-in. I think I'd quite like that, get on board check-in. It doesn't have to be that difficult. You don't have to do that much when you check in. You can do a lot of things on an app. Maybe they'll go towards doing more things before you get to check-in. But I think I'd quite like an outdoor check-in. Don't know why not. In almost all circumstances, the cruise line will insist that the onboard account is paid for using a credit card, a debit card, a bank transfer, some sort of contactless payment. Cash is only going to be accepted in very extreme circumstances. And I think they would want to know why you had to pay in cash. I know there's some people who still prefer dealing in cash. But if that is you, maybe think about going towards an electronic option. One area where it's going to be very difficult to social distance is going to be in the kids clubs, is going to be in the nursery. It says that the crew will be monitoring the children for signs of coronavirus and that they may limit the amount of children they can have there at one time. They may also change the events because normally there's quite a busy schedule for children and they may have to reduce or change that to make sure that the children can always stay apart from each other. I remember cruising as a child and we did things like make pizzas and have pajama parties, which was fantastic. You can still do those, but just further away from other children, I suppose. One thing that I really don't think is gonna work is that they're saying that when it comes to entertainment and in the theater, that social distance of 1.5 meters should still apply. 
To do that, you'd realistically have to cross off every other row and then have a seat or two between each group. Sometimes it's very difficult to get a seat in the theatre anyway. Some shows are very, very popular. And if they did this and they halved or more, I don't know how you'd ever get to see a show on a cruise. And that would be a massive shame. I like to go to the theatre pretty much every day. This guidance suggests that alcohol gel, hand gel should be at the entrance to every entertainment venue and that between every showing or every event that's going on, the venue should be completely cleaned. That's a lot of work. One area where staying away from people is going to be very, very difficult is in the casino. I can't see realistically how if you're around a roulette table, you can be 1.5 meters away from everybody else. They may put screens in place for things like that and they'll probably get rid of or at least close off some of the machines so that maybe every other machine is working. In reality, I'm not sure how this is going to work. Casinos can get quite busy. Maybe they'll have to limit how many people are in there. Only time will tell, but it is strongly recommended by these guidelines that all cruise lines make sure that everybody in a casino is 1.5 meters away from each other. In the casino, we will see markings on the floor so that people know where to stand and how to stay away from each other. It says that the crew will be monitoring this, so maybe they'll stop letting people in when it gets to a certain point or tell people to leave. Not too sure. The guidance suggests that all machines should be cleaned between uses. And I don't know about you, but if I go in the casino, I normally gamble about $5 and then I leave. So for someone to have to clean that between me using the machine, I probably just wouldn't bother going to the casino. And it's also recommended that food is not served in the casino anymore. It's gonna be a similar situation in the hairdressers, in the salons, in the gyms on board. They're gonna do their best to keep passengers apart. And if you do go for a massage, the person who gives you that massage will probably have a face mask on and various protective clothing. The same sort of thing is happening with the gym. All of the machines should be cleaned between every use, which I think is gonna be very, very difficult. And if you do do gym classes on board, it's suggested that you're broken down into these little groups. So maybe you would have a gym class group of 20 people and then another 20 later, and you'd have to go to your right class in order just to limit how many people you mix with there. When it comes to swimming pools, it is strongly recommended that you don't use indoor swimming pools. I'm not really too sure. I suppose it's because you're all kind of enclosed and the air circulates around. If you do have an indoor swimming pool which has a roof which can come off, that is okay. They do do that on some Viking cruise ships. But in my experience, most cruise ships that have this roof that's supposed to come off, it, it broke like 10 years ago. Most actually don't open. So you won't be able to use a pool in that situation. It's always been strongly recommended that you have a shower before you go in the pool, but now that's gonna be more strongly recommended. And it's also recommended that all of the sun loungers are that distance away, 1.5 meters from others. That's gonna make getting a sun lounger even more difficult. And if you've ever been on any cruise in the sunshine, you'll know how difficult it is to get outside space. So we'll see how this works in reality, but to me, I don't know, I really don't know. When it comes to actually sunbathing, if you do find a lounger, it's recommended that you use a towel or a covering that covers the complete seat. If the sun lounger normally has cushions or textiles on it, that won't be there because they can't constantly clean those. Another thing that I do like is that it's not recommended to go in a hot tub with people who aren't from your party or your cabin. It's always weirded me out that you'd want to go in a hot tub with other people anyway. To me, it feels like having a giant weird warm bath with strangers, but now it's guidelines. So now I won't seem strange for not wanting to go in a hot tub with other people. If you can find a space in the main pool, it's gonna be one person per four meters squared. I have a maths degree and I would really struggle to work out how many people could be in a swimming pool. And certain cruise ships have very small swimming pools where you'd probably only get one or two people in there. So how that's gonna work in practice, I would hope that there's a crew member who knows how many people are supposed to be in that pool. And if it gets over that limit, they can say, come on guys, this pool's only for four or something like that. If you go on a cruise line that has a business center or an internet cafe, something like that, we'll probably see those things closing and using the Wi-Fi on your mobile phone or your tablet on your laptop will be the way to go. 
They're also trying to discourage the use of public toilets, which if you're on a small ship, that's completely fine to walk back to your cabin. But if you're on one of these mega ships, you've got like a 10 minute walk back to your cabin. So it's not really practical in all situations. This is one of the reasons I love river cruising. If you're on a river cruise and you need to go to the toilet, you're within a few meters of your cabin, no matter where you are. But these big ships, you might have to walk down eight decks along back That'll be exhausting. Good for your step count, but exhausting. The most interesting part of these guidelines for me is that they talk not just about how we're gonna prevent coronavirus, but they also acknowledge that we will probably get coronavirus cases on cruise ships. A lot of people don't have symptoms, maybe they're asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic, and with that many people on a cruise ship, it's quite a high chance that somebody is gonna get coronavirus. Cruise ships must be able to isolate 5% of the passengers in cabins by themselves. If you are somebody who does get coronavirus on a cruise, you'll be isolated in your cabin until you can get to land and then you'll be taken to hospital. This may be the case for other people who you've been in close contact with, your family, your group, other people like that will probably need to quarantine and they may go with you on land. Before any cruise line can cruise, they need to have a lot of things in place. So they need to know that on land, on the ports that they're visiting, they will be able to get medical care if somebody does have coronavirus. They need to have things in place where they can quarantine people, whether this is a specific hotel or a place that people can go if they've got coronavirus. They need to have all of this planned out before they can consider a cruise. They need to make sure that on the ship that they've got all of the right equipment, the right medical care. There are a lot of things that a cruise ship needs to do before it can cruise. The cruise line is gonna be constantly monitoring the places that the cruise ship is going. They're gonna be looking at cases. They're gonna be maybe changing the itinerary if somewhere has had a recent coronavirus outbreak. They're gonna do everything they can to avoid coronavirus, but I do think that it's really good that they're being realistic and thinking, okay, if somebody does get coronavirus, we can take them off, we'll take them to this hotel. We know that there's medical care there. We can get them home again. That's very, very important and we do have a plan. I think that's very good. If there are multiple people on a cruise who do have coronavirus, it's very likely that that cruise will be cut short or it will be canceled. At that point, everybody would be disembarked and they would be flown home. There would already be a plan for this, so they wouldn't just kick you off in the middle of nowhere. The cruise line would look after you. Don't worry about that. Thank you for watching this. I'll see you in this next video. When it comes to masks, it is very important that cats do not wear masks. See, he doesn't like it. Say hello. Oh.